Hello everybody, my name is Eric, and today we're going to be taking a look at a strange new way of packaging malware. Now, I couldn't instantly figure this out, so it took me a bit of time, but we'll go through it. So, what do we have here? Well, we have a installer package that's being distributed from the usual sources, and we suspect is going to eventually result in our information being stolen, but not quite in the same way as usual. So, let's try this out. So, this claims to be an installer for Jupe app. Now, the fact that that might sound like duplication is not related as far as I know. So, we got to confirm that we're human. Now, this is something a lot of applications are now doing to stop automated sandboxes, is they will put an OK box that you have to click on. Of course, given we are human, we can do it. I'm also going to turn on MITM proxy, and now we're going to go OK. So, we've sent our collected data, and what do we find? Well, this is what's sent initially. And then from that, it's like, uh, gave up. Okay, so what's happened then is the command and control for this piece of the installer has died, but lucky for me, I already have the information. Now, what does this command and control server actually do? Well, essentially, and it's called software license, and that is essentially what it does, is it goes to, it gets the password for an encrypted role. Now, lucky for me, I already have that encrypted rel decrypted, so good luck with that. This is the rel, and what it contains is just one innocuous file. Now, I couldn't quite figure out how this worked initially, because what we have here, and this is where you would assume the payload is, is an NVIDIA GeForce Experience.exe. Now we can look at this. It's all real, uh, the digital signature is valid. I thought, okay, maybe the NVIDIA breach. No, it's not the NVIDIA breach. And we can actually go over to virus total. While we're waiting for the scanners, I just wanted to introduce you to today's sponsor. This video is sponsored by Private Internet Access, which roughly does what it says on the tin. Private Internet Access is a VPN service that allows you to hide your IP address and change your location around the world. Now, what do we use this for? Well, there are a couple of benefits. One of them is, of course, if you're doing any sort of security research, especially if you're looking into malvertising campaigns as I often do, and you want to see how that differs around the world, private internet access can help. Another key use case for research is maybe we have to access something uh, that is blocked somewhere. You can also, if, if you're into streaming services, there's actually a really great website called unogs.com where you can actually search. So, for example, did you know you can actually watch the Apothecary Diaries on Netflix in a few countries? Well, thanks to a VPN, you can watch it anywhere. My favorite things about private internet access being that I produce this content on Linux, and I find having a graphical user interface just makes a VPN easier to navigate, is that it's one of the few VPNs that has a graphical app on Linux. As you can see, here we've got my private internet access right in front of my... Uh, this is on KDE on Arch Linux, right in front of my... VM. It was straightforward, easy to set up. Click the link in the video description, piavpn.com slash Eric Parker, to get the best price available on private internet access VPN for just $2 a month with four months free on a two-year plan. Now back to your scheduled programming. And look, I don't, as I've said many times, I don't put a lot of stock into signature detections, but the date on here does give us a strong indication, given that this malware campaign has not been around that long, and the fact that this is a validly digitally signed piece of code. So, where's the magic? Well, note that DLL that came from the encrypted raw file. What's that doing? And how does NVIDIA GeForce Experience work? Well, GeForce Experience is actually an Electron app. And libcef is the Chromium Embedded Framework. Now, one of the many criticisms of Electron apps is that they have a big file size, and that's because of this. So this one only being 800 kilobytes is a massive red flag. I actually checked, the real one is 100 megabytes. And if we upload this one, uh, we start getting hits. This one is well known to be malicious. Another thing we can do just to see is, oh, okay. That's not what happens when you run NVIDIA GeForce Experience. And if we were to move this to a different folder, we get a very different response. 
And if you attempt to execute it without that DLL, it just gives an error. The thing that happens whenever we click OK is nhit66.com gets a query in the DNS, but unfortunately it doesn't exist anymore. Wait a second. Now, unfortunately the command and control server is dead, but thanks to Malwarebazaar, there is a record. So it has a command and control server at this that then would go here, if it was still up. Now, unfortunately, nhit66.com is dead, but Software License 1 was still alive when I first started testing this, and the ultimate destination, if it was able to reach this, would be a Luma. So it's got a couple of layers in here. So now let's take a look inside the DLL for how this actually works. Now I would uh, show a normal libcf for comparison, but because it's such a big file, it would take a while. The real one uh, contains a bunch of Chromium code. You can also go on over and look at uh, what exactly is being exported, and we find this function, and then right above it is a function that we do see the real program call. So we start off. Now how does this one get loaded? Well, this one gets called by this function, and that one gets called by the DLL entry. So the technique here is pretty straightforward. The way Windows works, if you try to load a DLL, especially if it's a DLL that ships with the program, uh, that is just done off of the name of the file. This is the same way if you watched my Minecraft mod malware video, where I used a modified DLL to allow us to play Minecraft without a graphics card by emulating one. Uh, it works the same way. So the NVIDIA executable will just assume that the DLL libcf is what it thinks it is, and from this, libcf executes and takes hold and is then able to execute what it wants to do. And it does this through a few of these, uh, does it calls, let's see which, it's a zero, so maybe not, but it's calling virtual protect. It's getting, getting a file, MUI path, calls a bunch of stuff through here. And this is where our little lovely pop-up comes from, is down here. Under certain circumstances, uh, we send that string off for some reason, and that's what we do. Now, unfortunately, it's impossible uh, to demonstrate the last few steps because the command and control server is dead. We can also, of course, with a debugger, we can watch it in the act. You gotta be careful, that's why you never ever try to debug malware on your main computer, because the DLL in this case is actually loaded before the program starts, so before we hit our initial breakpoint, we've already loaded it. So we can, we can change the settings. Now uh, we end up in libcf, just like we wanted. And like magic, we call the function. Information. Uh, none of the information in here is very useful, unfortunately, but, and through using string search, there we go, this is how this goes. Boom. Information, and this would send a call to message box. Now the pop-up here, uh, we can see, is actually conditional on the existence of this directory in temp. If we change that, and that's I guess because this part of the payload is only intended to run once, if we change that, uh, we no longer get a pop-up. We get several more uh, network requests uh, that ultimately don't succeed. So here I've got another payload that is using the same technique, except this one is for the initial uh, install dropper. So we'll just extract that and we'll put in the password. It's, it's, it's a raw zip, I don't know, that's probably to beat some uh, thing. Now, note, we've got a couple of files here. This is similar to a different version of this setup.exe, but this one has swapped out the legitimate app. And if we go over to Detected Easy, that's P Detective, but that'll work. There's nothing weird in here, and it is in fact a properly signed uh, executable that is legitimate software. So, how does this work? Well, first of all we can look and see at the properties and we can see that this is actually not supposed to be a setup.exe. This is actually supposed to be a screen recorder. And it originally had a more logical name. So, what is the trick? Well, there's this DLL file sitting right next to it that looks quite suspicious. So this web UI DLL is going to be our malware. So to confirm that that is correct, uh, let's just open this up. And we'll also uh, confirm uh, when we go over to setup that this is what we are expecting it to be. 
And you can just see, okay, webui.dll, so this is definitely imported. And you can also go to imports and just say, okay, what's being, yep. So this is actually supposed to be a WebKit UI. So this is similar to an Electron app, but it's a bit more, uh, it's a bit lighter. And usually uh, the function won't be terribly far from the start. Oh, that's interesting. That doesn't look very legit. Now these kind of packers are often going to be filled with junk code. But the main thing we want to do is before we try and uh, debug this, uh, we got to be sure that our settings are right uh, so that we don't accidentally execute it until we want to execute it. Oh, that's not so good. So, uh, oh well, it uh, looks like we did execute the stealer. Once again, never ever try uh, doing any of this on your main computer. Never debug outside of VM. And here we go. Here's the entry, and that was the exit. And this is actually the main entry uh, for the malicious function, and we can see some uh, interesting functionality. Last but certainly not least, uh, let's now just run it and see uh, what the network does. Nothing so far. Second time is the charm. A pretty much immediate hit to a Luma Stealer API. Chrome browser version.txt. That is to get instructions about oh Opera. Oh yeah, because we got so many browsers on this thing. Oh, and this one because uh, Cloudflare. I, I've I've ragged on Crowd Cloudflare, but Cloudflare have actually started to do their job, and as a result. Uh, these droppers are actually having problems that they never had before. Life has become a lot more difficult uh, for these people. Here it seems like we've got an additional payload from fileworld.shop. Now .shop is, well, I, while I'm sure there are people who might be using it for legitimate purposes, is heavily associated with Luma Stealer. <laughs> I just love how it keeps failing, keeps getting told, uh, sorry, it's not gonna work. I almost feel bad for the poor Luma Stealer. At least it did finally realize its dreams of uh, sending network requests. Uh, one of the dot .shop domains was still up, uh, and it doesn't seem to do anything else. So, uh, th that's all for this sample. Just thought we'd get another one in to show this uh, technique. So, there we go. Uh, we've gotten through most of it. So, okay. So, what do you do? Well, the big thing is, this is another reason I... And I was asked to make a video sort of going over how you use virus total. I might do that, but I don't at this point really recommend relying on virus total as a primary source, purely because tricks like this exist where the exe is harmless and a DLL, and you might not know off the top of your head, you can of course check the imports, which DLL is going to be malicious. So it just becomes a very tricky. Like, if we upload, see if it catches the installer as being malicious. Only one hit, because the payload is an encrypted raw where you have to go over the internet, so you cannot statically unpack that, and it's it's not a password 123, it's, it's quite a long password, so there's really no way for a scanner to detect that. And then when the second piece executes... The EXE that you might check is legitimate and harmless. So what can you do? Well, first of all, harmless EXE that is out of place is still suspicious. If you see NVIDIA's GeForce experience running out of your app data folder, not in an NVIDIA folder, it's malware. Doesn't matter how it's being done, there's something wrong. The other piece of advice is you just cannot rely on just uploading a file anymore. So how do you know? Well, you got to be very small. you got to think about, okay, uh, does this make sense? Is this legit? The other thing is using a good antivirus, like, for example, Bitdefender, which I made a video showcasing, can help because while it is very difficult statically to determine the legitimacy, when the libcf is loaded... It's quite straightforward because libcf is not packed in any way, and it'd be quite easy to figure out at that point, okay, this is a dropper, and stop it there. So that's what should happen. So that's going to be all for this video. Hope you enjoyed it. Please leave a like and subscribe if you did. That's all for now. Bye.